people get hung up in these details without even starting the big picture. They're already worried about which way do you do this and that, and, the, and the, really, you just got to start. Okay. I think you stop when you're either comfortable with the bike or you're not comfortable with what you're doing. And SAG is just a place to start. Yeah. So don't get hung up on, I, I'm in my attack position, I've got my elbows up, I've got this or that. Just get on the bike. Okay. So I would say like okay. Loic, Finn, and then definitely Amory and Thibaut. They're, they're, they're on a slightly different trajectory. Geordie Cortez, welcome back to the Downtime Podcast, man. How's things? Oh, Chris, good to see you again. Uh, everything's, I mean, strange, but we're moving along. <laughs> yeah, strange times for the industry, for sure. And we're going to chat a lot yes. about suspension setup. But before we do that, just like a little quick reflection back. How was 2023 for you? Like it was a pretty hectic season all in. It was a hectic season. So many unknowns and kind of random changes to our normal schedule. Um, really hard to plan for something with no details. So it, <laughs> it was, there was definitely an added layer of stress to everything. But overall, it was a good year. Definitely yeah. a good year for us. Yeah, some good results. And excited for 2024. You had some new technology that you were testing with a few of the riders towards the end of the year. I think Jackson had some new stuff in the bike for his pretty insane Monson and run. I know Nico's been testing some bits, but you excited to roll out a few things next year? I, I'm getting there. <laughs> uh, I think maybe another month of being able to work from the office and kind of tying up loose ends and i think i'll be excited to start again yeah okay getting um, getting through we the do burnout. have some really cool projects so that that part is exciting yeah nice that'd be cool man well yeah i want to try and dig into suspension setup a bit for myself and the guys on the team to try and help us improve our setup but also to help all the listeners because i think it's it's relevant to everybody um suspension setup is uh, very complex very nuanced but ultimately i think there's some areas where we can maybe take some fairly simple approaches and thoughts to help people get a long way towards having the perfect bike set up. It might not be the pro touch that you'd get having full Fox factory support and team camps and all that kind of stuff. But I think, you know, people can get pretty close to that and get a much better position. So let's start at the start. And I guess that's SAG really. Um, which end of the bike would you start with? Would you do you always go and set up like fork sag or shock sag first, or does you, do you not feel that matters? And I, I don't think it really matters. It would matter if you were incredibly far off, because as you tilt any axle in any direction, it's going to change. One's going to change the other. So if you let all the air out of your fork, your weight would be biased towards the front, and you tried to set sag in the back, it's not going to be super accurate. Yeah. Most people aren't doing that. Yes. You're not setting fork sag with no shock in the bike, right? You're, yeah, you're yeah. pretty close. Yeah, but you shouldn't. And I, I do think people get hung up in these details without even starting the big picture. They're already worried about which way do you do this and that. And, the, and the, really, you just got to start. Okay. Yeah. So making sure that you're in the ballpark, like you haven't got a fork with no air in it. And then you're trying to set shock sag kind of thing like ballpark things are roughly a bike like the bars are where you want the bars to be the forks have got yeah. an amount of air in that's broadly appropriate um and then go away and set it would you wind any damping off before you do that i've heard some people talk about winding shouldn't, compression damping off to do it but shouldn't make any difference um even lockouts to a certain extent uh aren't going to change where your bike sits with weight on it. Okay. Those things are all designed to slow down motion, not to hold things in a certain place. Yeah. Okay. So the spring is what sets your sag. Uh -huh. So if you're with a rider then, and you're going to measure sag on the fork and the shock, like what process would you go through? What steps would you take? I think the best thing is to find a nice flat piece of ground, which that's a holdover from motocross days of 
flat ground because we don't ride on flat ground, but <laughs> it works. And we, depending on bikes, then you're going to measure that shock sag. With an air shock, it's really easy. You just measure where the O-ring sits. With a coil shock, it's a little bit trickier, but uh, it's still quite easy for most people once you just start and figure it out. Yeah. Uh, some people measure the two shock bolts, the eye to eye. I just measure the spring. Okay. Anything that's compressing at a one to one rate. Yeah. You can measure. You can measure spring to the shock bolt. You could do it however is convenient for you. Yeah. Again, don't get wrapped up in the details. Just think about what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. And how would you coach the rider? in how they stand on the bike and are you like getting them to cycle the shock and the fork a bit before you measure or yeah I give a couple bounces and then just sit in a neutral position again sag is just a place to start yeah so don't get hung up on i i'm in my attack position i've got my elbows up i've got this or that just get on the bike okay because i even flat pedal you know sneakers versus clipping in like none of that's gonna matter because you're just trying to find a starting point okay fair makes sense so yeah i always get stressed about like is that my neutral position like am i bi <laughs> am i a bit forward biased here what am i doing but yeah actually yeah. when you repeat the measurement in a few different slightly different positions it doesn't really make it's much, not much yeah and you and you're looking for I guess the SAG as recommended in either the fork manual or the manufacturer of the bike generally for the rear. It's a perfectly good place to start. Uh -huh. For us, we're generally 30% in the back, 15, 20 in the front, and maybe a bit less for a downhill bike. Okay. And when you say a bit less for a downhill bike, are you talking a downhill bike ridden by a quick rider or all downhill bikes? <laughs> no, I think... Almost everyone uh, would benefit from running a bit less sag on downhill bikes. Um, there's probably a few reasons that's a thing. Uh, one of them is that we're not actually measuring sag as all other sports do it, okay. which would be the wheel relative to where the wheel is moving. We're measuring shock travel. Mm -hmm which doesn't really have anything to do with where the rear wheel is. Okay. So a more progressive bike is going to use up less shock travel for the amount of rear wheel travel. Yeah. You know, moto is always the same kind of thing. You're measuring from the rear axle to a vertical point on the fender or whatever. Vehicle, car dynamics, same thing. You're measuring fender to center. Bikes, you're measuring this thing that's over here connected by a linkage that's then driven over here and... There's a lot of factors that change that. Yeah. Okay. So just getting, so, yeah, ballpark. So starting th yeah. 15, 20 forks, 30 rear, maybe a little lower. Yeah. And when you say lower on a downhill bike, just lower on the rear because we're talking about the linkage just thing. Just the rear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you, you mentioned obviously air and coil spring are the two different options. On the coil versus air side of things, like if we take the whole performance side out of things, is there one you'd recommend over the other for a lot of people like it feels like air is more straightforward from a setup perspective because you're not trying to chase the right spring weight and all that kind of stuff like you buy a shock you put air in it until it's right whereas touring and throwing on springs can be a bit more complicated yeah I, and that's one way to look at it i mean the other way is that once you've put a spring on you're done okay yeah. You don't have to think about air pressure anymore. True. Um, but there's definitely the ease of an air shock and not having to chase spring rates down. And, you know, oh, I'm at a, I need a 400 or I need a 415 or a 425. You're going to get much more precise with an air shock for sure. Yeah. The, the other thing is that if, if your bike isn't somewhat modern in kinematics, it's very possible that a coil shock just isn't going to work. Okay, yeah. So if you're not in that 20 plus percent progression, you're probably going to struggle with an air shock or with a, sorry, with, with a coil, coil shock. Because you'll just blow through the travel yeah. or you'll have to yeah. have it so stiff that it's not going exactly. to work very well. Yeah, okay, fair enough. So we've got 
we've got a shock on our foot, we've got our, let's say, pressure or spring or whatever in there, and we need to then start thinking about rebound and compression. First, before we get into the details too much of those, and again, this might be another simplification, is it fair to say that rebound is kind of related to your weight and your kind of spring or air pressure and compression is a bit more related to your like your riding style and your pace like your level of skill on the bike or is that am i missing something more complex i think rebound is definitely directly related to your spring okay and at the very very sharp end of things it can also be related to your strength and and agility Mm -hmm. but that's doesn't really matter yeah uh Compression, uh, I think you'd be surprised that you don't see a massive change in compressions from an average size rider to a really heavy rider, from a decent rider to a World Cup rider. Uh You're not, shock compression has a lot to do with the bike. Okay, yep, and the kinematic, right? The kinematics that have been designed into that bike. And fork compression still has a lot to do with the spring. <laughs> um, so in some, somewhat, it is a little bit weight related, uh-huh. but it's far less than you would think. Whereas rebounds are directly related to a rider weight, basically. Mm-hmm. Compressions are not, not as uh, obvious. Yeah. So if, like me, then you plan to put on a few kilos over Christmas, it's the rebound settings that you've got to change in January. Well, first it would be your spring. Yeah. You'd have to go back and set sag again and then set rebound. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and that's a common one for me as well. They, I, I, You know, I spent like three months sick and I probably put on 10 pounds. Uh-huh. And then I hop on a bike that I've been riding for a year and it's not quite right. Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely been through that. You get on it, you sit on it, you're like, this feels a bit weird. And then you remeasure sag and you're like, oh, yeah, okay, I've put on some kilos here. Yeah, it happens. Fair play. Right, so sag's in. We're happy with that for now. And I guess, like, certainly on the Fox side of things anyway, you do a really good job of giving the rebound settings in the manual uh, in those kind of charts that, set, you know, you look up where you're at on pressure or spring or whatever and... You can read across and and look at where you want to be roughly for high speed and low speed rebound settings. Would you say that those charts are generally like a a good place to start for most people or even a good place to finish for most people? I think if that's all you can do, then yeah. Uh I definitely don't recommend going by the air pressure recommendations because there's just no way of gauging that everybody's setup is a little bit different everybody's riding style is a little bit different and that's going to contribute to your sag sag is still critical okay so would you so, would you go off the weight based settings then because i think they use they give like a kilo weight for the rider and also an air pressure like line if i remember from the manuals i think it's your weight equates to a certain air pressure yeah, which yeah. equates to a certain rebound so i, I if you can't set sag, then no, okay. I'm not really sure where to start. Yeah, yeah. Like, so, assu- so assuming you've set sag, then and you know the pressure in your fork, you would you, you would read off the pressure line yeah. and not your weight line. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Okay, got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And and that'll that'll give you immediately a, a big step up on just plugging in. This is my weight. This is my pressure. Yeah. This is my settings. Yeah. And are those charts? Like, are they designed, are they kind of aimed at your average rider or are they aimed at all riders? Like, I'm, I'm not really sure, like, what goes into making those charts. <laughs> Neither are lots of us. <laughs> I, I think uh, they change over time and we are getting more and more sophisticated with how we come up with those. And we're doing some pretty cool stuff with data analysis and relating that to the average rider Mm -hmm. all of those things are set up as an average yeah so while you can't go really wrong you could definitely go more right 
Okay, yeah, I see what you're saying. And so is that, when you say it's like as an average, is that an average rider for that product category? I'll give an example. So I have a set of Fox 36s that I run the rebound faster than the manual would suggest. That feels pretty good to me. Mm -hmm. I then got a pair of Fox 40s and I tried running those faster than the manual settings and it was pretty punishing and I ended up, I did a load of bracketing and I ended up coming back actually when I got home and checked to the manual settings. And I was wondering if like maybe I sit closer to the average rider for a pair of Fox 36s, but I'm worse than the average rider that rides a pair of Fox 40s. Does that make sense? I doubt it. I think that if you broke down outside factors like reach, crank lengths, bar, stem, something, you'd find something that's quite a bit different from your downhill bike to your trail bike. Got you. Okay. Because so many things can affect the way suspension feels. Okay. Yeah. So for everyone then, the manual is a good, a really good place to start. Like you say, it's going to get you yeah. in a good direction. It might not be perfect, but it's a good, a really good place to start from. Yeah, I think there's kind of three groups of people. There's people that don't do anything uh -huh. and bolt it on and go ride it. Yeah. Then there's people that look at the factory settings and put those in and they're good. And then there's people that start completely fresh. <laughs> So and spend them. you can mix those if you want yeah. to, or you can just pick one and do it. Yeah, but it's, the more work you put in, the better your experience is going to be. True. It is easy to get a bit lost in the puzzle, though, hey, and like end up spending more time fiddling than you do riding your bike. But there's a there's a yes. I think for a lot of us, there's a bit of a pleasure in that. I think we kind of enjoy that. Like, what does this do? Is that better? Can I feel that? What's going on here? Like, there's a, there's that's fun to us, right? Certainly on some rides, anyway. Yeah. And I mean, at the end of the day, that's all it is, is feel. Yeah. And if you never change anything, you never learn the feel. Yeah. So. Yeah. You might as well. Yeah, definitely. We'll talk a bit about bracket in a sec, but um, before we move on to compression, we should talk about counting clicks. For, for Fox, at least, they're always counted from closed, right? Yes. What I'm never sure of is like you can go past the final click almost to a hard stop and then you can start to open the dial again so is the first yeah. click that you reach click one or click zero for me it's click one okay same i know even internally we argue about this and i think shocked <laughs> i think the flow deck started with a click zero and i was just like oh how did we do this <laughs> okay but i, I don't I don't understand how you have 10 of something and you're counting them. The first one isn't zero. Yeah, makes sense. So, yeah, I guess <laughs> it depends whether you're supposed to go to the hard stop and start coming back or to the final click yeah. and start counting back. So it's from the hard stop and then you count. The first click you get to is click one. Good. Yeah. All right. And don't don't cram it closed. Okay. The hard stop is just... Yeah, gentle. Yeah, yeah. Because you, yeah. Yeah, you can cause damage, I think, if you push too hard against I'm some sure of those, right? Yeah. yeah, okay. So You're not going to find an extra hidden click. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's not more There's not more there. Um, so rebound settings are pretty well detailed in the manual. Compression settings are a little... There's a bit less guidance in the manual for compression settings, I think. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, compression is, again, very dependent on kinematics mm -hmm. and rider position. So it's very hard to give a recommended compression setting. Okay. So, uh, and you'd definitely be better off more open than more closed. Okay. For the most part. Yeah. So how would you recommend to someone that maybe doesn't have a huge, like, knowledge of suspension and the workings and some of this terminology, how would you recommend... Where would they start on compression? Maybe fully open is the answer. I don't know. And how right. would you how would you think about mm, moving towards a better place for them? I think fully open is the way to start for most people. Mm -hmm. And really, what you do is just go ride it a little bit and get familiar with what it does. If you want to ride it full open, and you want to make sure you can feel it, then close them both fully. Yeah. It's going to immediately give you an idea of what compression feels like. And that's a loose way to start. Go full open, full closed, middle. 
and right away you're going to eliminate 50 percent of that compression yeah because it's going to either be better on the open side or the closed side mm -hmm. so it's pretty quick to get a decent setup yeah and this is what people call bracketing right so you're you're moving from exactly. one end of a bracket to the other how does it feel yep. better or worse okay well let's go closer to the better end how does that feel better or worse and working yep. your way through that would you recommend like from the start you said like wind both let's say we've got low speed and high speed compression adjustment would you wind both fully open both fully shut or would you keep trying to keep those two separate like how would you recommend people approach that because that's where it gets I really would recommend starting with them open mm -hmm. and then your first one is going to be low speed compression because that really sets the attitude of the bike mm -hmm. uh L low speed compressions are generally just an, a flowing orifice so it's not it's not a smart circuit in any way it doesn't change for speed or, or position it's just a, a hole that oil is flowing through okay so you set that baseline to something that feels decent and then you can start adding in some high speed to prevent a bit of bottom out or to get a bit more support sometimes you just don't need it yeah so low speed is kind of can we think about that as a way of almost balancing the bike front to rear is that a, a good way to yeah think in, a, about in a way that's that's a bit of it, yeah. So if you feel all like, that low speed is doing is slowing down small movements. Yeah. So if you feel like you're kind of like struggling to weight the front, maybe then not taking a click of low speed off the fork might help you get a bit further forward. The fork will sit in yep. a bit more. But I guess there's a compromise to adding low speed compression as well, right? In in that it takes away some of the sensitivity. Is that? Yeah, it's going to slow the motion down a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you hit something, it's the fork is not going to move out of the way as quickly. Yeah. It does add more feel, like you get more ground feel, and it makes for a more predictable bike, chassis, ride. Uh -huh. But it will, at a certain point, it will get harsh, and you will start to lose traction. Yeah. And potentially, like, if you're an arm pump sufferer, for example like low reducing low speed compression would that potentially help ease that up a little bit but the compromise being your positioning on the bike and this is where it gets complicated yeah. right it does i guess it, it does get complicated the thing all of these things end up circling back on themselves so so many people will say they get arm pump and take all the compression off and it it gets worse okay which either means that you didn't bracket it right in the first place because you actually need damping. You need some of these things to hold you up, to slow down motion. But that arm pump could have come from some other place. Yeah. And now you're trying to fix it with suspension. So stick to the basics. Like get it in a in a good average position. And then you need to have a little bit of faith that you did the work. And then if you're feeling something a little bit off one day, it's it hasn't changed. <laughs> yeah. It's more likely that the person has changed than the suspension has changed. Yes, okay. Fair. So we've talked a bit about low speed compression. What about high speed compression? So that's more as I understand, like if you're at a bike park and you're hitting berms hard, it's that the force that you're putting into the bike on a harsh compression or for you know a big landing, it's stopping the fork or the shock blowing through the travel so much is that am i kind of close with that yeah that's that's pretty accurate high speed compression is generally metered by a valve stack so you can adjust the little valves inside the shims to change the way they flex out of the way as the oil pushes on them you can make them lighter or firmer or you can you can do all kinds of different things with them yeah but for the most part once your low speed circuit has flown as float as much oil as possible. The rest of that oil has to go somewhere and that starts pushing through the high speed circuit. Got you. So the high speed circuit will, it does kind of affect everything to a point, but it is more for the harder hits, the faster suspension movements. Mm -hmm. So it has nothing to do with how fast you're going. Even if you're going two miles an hour and you do a, a decent sized drop off of something, that's gonna be your high speed circuit.
Got you. Okay. And how would you know what what might wanting more high speed compression feel like? Is it that you're like constantly bottoming the bike or you feel you're blowing through? Yeah, I think if you're constantly bottoming, you're probably going to look at volume first. Okay. And double check that your sag is correct. Uh, and if everything there is correct, then you're going to want to add in compression. Okay. But very sparingly for the most part. Yeah, okay. So th there's a trade-off here, I guess, right? Again, like high-speed compression is going to make things harsher and sort of it'll make the forks sit a bit higher maybe higher. Um, yeah. in its travel. So with trading off like almost function of the fork and the ability for it to absorb bumps for that support, another way to get something similar then is to add the volume spaces. I, I don't quite, I'm not, it's not quite clear in my head when to go down the volume spacer route versus going down the high speed compression route. So, one way to think about it is that compression works everywhere from the very beginning to the very end. It's always the same. Mm -hmm. There is no mid stroke compression. <laughs> yeah, okay. People have learned this mid stroke word and it's not a thing. Yeah. Uh, mid stroke is handled by the spring and the amount of volume that you put in or take out, mm -hmm. or it's by the kinematics of the frame designer. So if your sag is good and you're bottoming out all the time, you need to look towards volume spacers. Okay. If your sag is good and you're never even close, then you also look at volume spacers. <laughs> okay, but, but you, you go, go the other way. Out. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think that's a problem that a lot of people get themselves into because doing a volume spacer requires a tool and a pump and a volume spacer. Yeah. You actually have to sit down and do it, where turning a knob is right in front of you. Yeah. But it's probably not the right thing to do. Okay. You're probably going to be compromising the performance of your suspension when you don't need to. More than likely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Especially if you've been riding this bike for a while and all of a sudden it's this and you go down and turn the compression knob. <laughs> yeah. Got you. Okay. That makes sense. So, yeah, if, you, if your sag's right and you're constantly bottoming out, then it's time for tokens. If you're nowhere near it, it's time to take them out. Um, yeah. If you are on the lighter end of the spectrum and you've already got no token, no volume spaces in the fork, what would you do then? Would you look to like run a bit more sag maybe? Or how do you deal with that? You could try running a bit more sag. Um, you would definitely want to run as little compression as you can. Mm -hmm. I think most people that are really, really light end up struggling with rebounds. Okay. In that um, they can't get them fast enough. Yeah. But we're talking pretty far on the lightweight side of things. Okay, fair enough. I don't think I need to worry about that right now. No. Um, <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about rebound then. So, again, quite often now we have high and low speed rebound adjustment. How would you define those two different um, adjusters, basically. I think the, the, the funny thing for me is that so many people are like, oh, I understand compression perfectly well, but I don't understand rebound. If you took our damper out and flipped it upside down, it would still work. Yeah. It's the exact same thing. The, there's, a, there's a low speed compression and a high speed compression and there's a low speed rebound and a high speed rebound and they look the same. Okay. They provide the same function. One's an orifice, which is low speed, one's a valve stack, which is high speed. Mm -hmm. So low low speed compression is your basic ride quality, your your balance. High speed compression is for bigger hits, bottom out, more support. That's exactly the same for rebound except that it all it sees is the forces pushing against it, which is your spring. Okay. Yeah, so it's that simple, so, right? It's that simple. It is the exact same thing. <laughs> okay, so how would we, is it possible to give some characteristics maybe of a bike that is, let's start off with being overly fast, not enough rebound damping on either the high speed or the low speed circuit? Or what might that feel like? 
it, it tends to feel very nervous. That the bike's moving so much, you don't get a very planted feel. You don't get as much ground feel. Um, traction can probably get better with fast rebound. Mm-hmm. And single event hits are going to be still going to be good because you've got this full travel fork to use because it's always riding high in the travel. You'll also feel the bars be quite high relative to slowing the rebound down. Yeah, okay. Um, And I think in the last few years, there's definitely been this push to run fast, fast rebound. Yeah. Which without something to measure it against, I'm... It's hard to say what fast rebound is. Uh-huh. Um, I, I think if anything, you'd want to err on the fast side, for me at least. Yeah. But uh, you don't... There is no benefit to just going really fast. Yeah, okay. Not just wide open on all those dials no. and hoping no. that it's just going to smash through stuff. Are there certain things that if you were riding and you felt you'd be like, oh, I'm a bit too fast on high-speed rebound here or I'm a bit too fast on low-speed rebound. Like, how would you... Is it possible to try and separate those in terms of how you would describe the on-trail behavior of either of them being too fast? Oh, man, that's a good one. To to actually put into words, uh, it's much easier to do by feel than it is to say, oh, this is... It feels like this. Um, and... Well- more than anything else, those two work together. Yeah, okay. Compression, you could have low-speed compression closed and high-speed high speed open. Your bike would still work okay. Yeah. If you tried that with rebound, I think you end up just not getting much out of it. Uh, okay. Is there some crosstalk between those two? Like, does... Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so if you wind on low-speed, you'll also be slowing the high-speed end of that curve yeah. as well. Yeah, and it's the yeah. same with compression, but it's nothing to get wrapped up in. Yeah. So many people ask, well, where where exactly does it cross over? <laughs> it's like, I have, I have no idea. It really depends on pressure and where your settings are. But the fact is that it should be a smooth line. You shouldn't really see a, this is low, this is high. Yeah. It should be a seamless act. Yeah, there isn't a, a shift point between the two no, speeds. Hopefully, but hopefully not. Like... Are there certain things that a rider comes into the pits at a World Cup and says to you that lead you towards either the low speed or the high speed rebound? Are there certain or noises or, you know, I like some of these guys like to make a few random noises at you. But (laughs) I think one of the most telling ones is um, entering a berm at a a decent clip because the bike's going to compress when it transfers all the way into the berm, the bike's going to compress and when rebound is too fast in the front, the front end tends to come up quickly and you want you're gonna oversteer. Okay. So you wanna you'll turn out of the berm because the head angle got really slack again and the weight came off the front wheel. Uh-huh. If the rebound's fast in the back, it does the opposite. It kind of drives all the weight onto the front wheel. The front wheel tends to turn in a bit and you you tend to push in. Yeah. So that's a that's a quick easy way, but again, that's not everybody finds hard compression berms. Yeah, to fair. ride on it really depends on your trail. Yeah. The other thing is, on steep terrain, a lot of rebound really depends on how much weight you have on either the bars or the pedals. Mm-hmm. So if it's consistently steep and your hands are always pushing on the bars, you're actually compressing that suspension so the rebound's going to be a little bit slower if you hook up data to these things you can see that on steep terrain the same setting is a little bit faster than on flat terrain okay yeah so we don't always get this perfect rebound no but i guess the same in the back on flat terrain your weight is more centered over that axle it's a little bit easier to control you might feel it on jumps yeah. Where, you know, you hit the limp, everything compresses, and the rear wheel wants to go pass over your head. I've definitely had that. So is that, uh, that's a, for me, in my head, I'm like, I need to slow down the high speed rebound in that instance because it's coming from more than likely, yeah. Deep stroke, like, and 
rapidly returning and trying to almost buck you over the front. Yeah, that's a pretty telltale for rebound. Yeah. But you could the one also... where people get confused is multiple bumps. Okay. Or they say they get bucked. Bucked is the new the new term now. And it doesn't mean anything. It could mean that your rebound's really slow mm-hmm. and you didn't have any suspension to use on that hit. So then you got bucked. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, so at like an an indication, I guess, of rebounds being too slow is what I think have you heard the term packing, where like yeah. as you go over repeated, like if you're on sort of braking bumps or something, the bike feels good as you go in, it gets progressively and progressively worse feeling as the suspension just doesn't have the speed to recover in order to absorb the next hit in the line, basically. So it's maybe exactly. easier to pin down rebounds that are a bit too slow than it is rebounds a bit fast, maybe. I don't know. Packing is quite, an, I find anyway, quite an obvious even at a very amateur level, like quite an obvious thing to feel on a bike. Yeah, I think you'd be surprised. I, I find people that you really have to get them to go find something and ask them, is it a single event hit or is this multiple hits? And then it felt bad. Okay. And then they come back and they go, oh, no, it was just it was just the one. I'm like, okay, well, that's probably rebound. Or, yeah, yeah I went in and I hit three bumps and the third one was horrible. I got kicked. Well, then rebounds probably slow. Yeah, got it, yeah, okay. But again, this is where bracketing. So I had issues with arm pump at the first race of the year, and sort of put it down to fitness initially. But then I had, I was like, right, let's just go and play for a day and see what fork settings do. Because like this is my example I said earlier, where I was like, oh, I normally run a bit faster rebound than the manual settings with Fox, so I'll do that. And that's where I'll start. And I just put them on, went and rode it. It felt kind of okay. But I was suffering with arm pump in the rides that I'd done up to that like race. But I didn't have any baseline on that bike. So I didn't know whether arm pump was normal for me riding a downhill bike down those tracks because I'd never done it before. Um, anyway, so I took myself off for a day. I was like, and just drew up a little list. I was like, right, from the setting I'm at, let's call that where we start. And first run... Well, I just do two or three runs, just get this track that I know well, like dialed, get a speed on it that I feel comfortable with, that I can ride at all day. And then we'll try two clicks open on low speed rebound, two clicks more closed on low speed rebound, see which is better. Same on the high speed circuit. And it was, I don't think, I mean, I'm not a great rider. I don't think I have the best feel, but I'm quite analytical, I guess. I was really surprised how obvious mm-hmm. those differences were. Like even just going two clicks in one direction, you could re- I could really feel that because I knew what the bike was doing on that track and it was eye-opening. So yeah, I ended up on a setting that I felt way more composed on my I was getting way less fatigue through the upper body and felt like I had more grip as well and like a more composed bike. And yeah. then yeah, got home and checked it against the manual settings and I was back exactly to where I should have started from. <laughs> That's perfect. But yeah, yeah I mean, there's that, so that whole, many little things going on at once that you don't really have to focus on these things, but it is kind of fascinating how, how many changes a click of rebound makes, whether it's bringing the bars down, it's putting more weight on the front tire. It, there's, there's so many little things that it affects. Um, we've also seen quite a few people complain of arm pump and it turns out that the shock is too fast. Uh, okay, which is what, like forcing them onto the front more? or Forcing you onto the bars and you're constantly pushing back to try to keep the weight back over the back wheel. <laughs> no way. So it's all connected and it's all a cycle. You, you can't just do one thing and then come back, do another. It's always kind of circling through these things. Yeah, and then like it, something like as simple as, oh, I just got a new handlebar, it almost, every time I change anything, I feel like it's, it doesn't take you back to the start, but the puzzle is re- the box of the puzzle has been reopened. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, put a two and a half mil stem spacer on. It feels like your bars just went up a mile and you can't ride the bike. And then in 15 minutes, you can't tell anymore. Yeah, you adapt, but right? These minor little changes are pretty drastic at first. And I think that's critical as well is to 
make changes with an open mind and explore them a little bit. Don't immediately go, nope, that didn't work. Yeah. But when do you, when do you stop? I guess that's the question. And I guess that point is different for everyone and their appetite for like digging into this because it is never ending. I mean, you, this is for you, for you, this is your, your life, right? This is what you spend a lot of your time doing with these races yeah. at the world cups. But like we don't, as riders, we don't need to be at that level. We don't need to be digging into it. But how would you, how do you know when to stop like and step away and be like, that's good enough? I think you stop when you're either comfortable with the bike or you're not comfortable with what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. It's it's far better to go, this, this is what I'm cool with working with. I'm just going to ride the bike now. Yeah. And I promise you, 99% of the people, it's not the bike and it's not the suspension. Mm -hmm. You can ride a pretty terrible setup and a pretty bad bike really fast. Yeah, because you know how to adapt and work around it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Comes I down think to bikes skill. are one of those things where it's still very rider focused. Yeah, for sure. Let's look at a few circumstances then that maybe we've got, I guess, what racers would call their base setting and we're going somewhere different to where we created that base setting, whether that's different terrain, different tracks or different environmentally, and maybe think about what direction we might want to head in with certain things. So hopefully there's some like fairly simple rules here that would at least help people head in the right direction. Um, so first off, I guess, let's say we're going and we're riding somewhere that's significantly colder than normal. So like in the UK right now, it's freezing outside. And, you know, if I go for a ride in the morning, it will probably be sub zero. So that will be maybe 20 degrees colder than it was in the summer. Like, would yeah. I look to change much? I I'd, I think I'd rather you didn't. Uh-huh. I'd really hate telling people to make preemptive changes. Okay. It's way better to go explore something and see if it works rather than just go, oh, it's 20 degrees colder. I need to open rebound two clicks. So more like go feel it and say, oh, yeah. the bike feels like this. And for me, yeah. that means I need to do, you know, I need to go faster on this circuit or whatever. Yeah. And the cold thing is weird because it's so many things outside of suspension. Yeah. You know, tire rubber is harder. Your hands don't feel as, you don't feel as good. Grips are harder. Everything's, everything's resisting movement, whether yeah, it's true. your body or, or your bike. Yeah. So to focus on the suspension side of things, there while well, there is a small gain to be made there, and rebound is probably one of them, mm -hmm. whether it's necessary or not is kind of debatable. Yeah. From a physics perspective, I guess the oil is a bit thicker, right? So it's going to run... For sure. Technically, it's going to run slower, whether that's actually an issue or not on that given day, given everything else that's changed. Who knows? But Yeah. I think... In forks, it could be a bit of an issue because mm -hmm. surface area is quite large. There's a fair bit of oil. Yeah. Um, they don't move as much as shocks do. Okay. Yeah. Shocks are quite small for the same amount of travel. They're, they're put through quite a bit more, uh, quite higher speeds and more motion. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a shock A is going to warm up quite quickly. Yeah. You know, maybe if you're pedaling a road for 45 minutes and nothing's moving and you all of a sudden turn into a really steep rough descent it's going to feel a bit thick yeah but it's not an absolute okay we Fair. do see it at races when one weekend will be snowing and the next weekend will be 35 degrees yeah but it, it's also again it's not just rebound it's this whole combination of the your your body feels freer and faster as does everything else so yeah and these are riders that, yeah these are riders that are chasing one percent and that's not yeah. the way most of us ride so yeah so yeah, i guess the same goes true. for a, a particularly warm day or if you fly away on holiday like let's say you're normally riding somewhere all year round then you go away and it's 20 degrees hotter where you are on holiday it's a similar thing right things are going to run a bit faster potentially um yeah. but a bit. Yeah, yeah, 
and then you need and to decide whether that's a problem. Doing that, yeah. Yeah, if you're like, oh, I'm just going to slow down rebound one, that's great. Go for it. But if you're kind of going, oh, I don't know if I should do this or this, then just don't. Yeah. Just just enjoy it. Just go with the flow. What about and- um, if, like, big changes in gradient? So, like, where I live now, the trails are pretty steep. Whereas if I go away somewhere, maybe I used to live and ride, the trails are very flat in comparison. Would that for you would that make any difference would you be changing some of that low speed compression like front rear balance stuff or you hear about riders wanting more support from the front when they're on steeper stuff yeah i think gradient is one of the things where you do look to making changes um it's more likely that it's just going to be a bit of air pressure or even a stem spacer or a slightly taller bar Okay. It's far easier to adjust your body than it is to go through suspension and make a bunch of changes. Mm -hmm. Because really all you're looking to do is get your hands up a little higher. Yeah. And I go through the same thing every time I travel. I get used to riding at home, which is really steep. But it's home and I'm used to it. And I can ride, I can get on things and be like, oh, this was great. And then I show up somewhere like Leger and I'm immediately like, this is awful. I need, <laughs> you know, I need 50 mil rise bars. I need to get my stem up. So some of it's just being comfortable and confident. Yeah. And whenever you travel, you usually aren't. Yeah, yeah. You're exploring something new and you immediately want to make a change, which there's nothing wrong with it, but it's probably not always right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You talk about putting a bit of extra air pressure in it in that steeper instance to lift the front. Would yeah. you then be going back to like the manual saying, and say, well, I've gone up however many PSI, that's moved me down a line in the manual, I'm going to change the rebound? Or would you say you're never really moving far enough in that instance that you'd want to change that stuff? So we said earlier should... we were linking the two, but... Yeah, I don't think your change should be big enough to warrant uh, revisiting the, the settings. I mean, you should always know where your settings are and double check them and make sure something hasn't changed. Yeah. Um, I still make mistakes doing that, just saying, oh, I'm going to close at one. Mm-hmm. And then I get back to the shop and I find out that it's completely opposite of what I thought it was. <laughs> and I just wasted a day of testing. So I think if you're going to add air pressure, just count your settings and make sure they're back where you where you started. But yeah. if you're going more than five PSI on, any, on a fork, maybe even 10 PSI on a shock, just yeah. because they're kind of almost two to one as far as what kind of pressures you're riding. Mm-hmm. That you don't really need to focus on rebounds unless it's something that really pops out at you. Yeah, okay, fair play. So you'd, you'd be looking at like a couple of PSI if you were going somewhere particularly steep. You yeah. wouldn't be changing uh, you know, big chunks. Five PSI. Otherwise, I think you probably have something wrong from the get-go. Yeah, okay, fair muddy tracks does that like people always used to talk about changing rebound speeds when it was muddy i don't know if that's really a thing i've i've never found that it's a thing uh i think people used to slow down rebound for mud races yeah and like you could make it make sense that your wheels got a bunch of mud on it and maybe it's heavier and it's 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 uh it's pulling down more so the the rebounds having to fight a heavier wheel yeah but i've never found that to be the case and i think slowing down rebound makes your bike sit lower makes everything steer a little bit slower and mud's already doing that so you're not going to get any more traction out of it mud's basically mud and the traction's going to be dictated by your tires <laughs> Uh, and then if you soften it up, then the bike just starts to move more. And that's kind of the last thing you want in a muddy race. Uh, So again, you just keep settings as they were basically. From, from where I sit and our experiences, we generally leave things. And if we need to make a change, we wait until people have ridden. Cause that's the big question you always get is, Oh, if it rains, what do we do? It's like, you leave it. 
Yeah. I mean, you don't do anything until you know that you need to do something. Well, it makes sense, I guess. If you've got something you know and you understand and the conditions are changing, the, con- the condition is the bit that you don't now know. Why would you change yeah. the bit that you do know, which is the bike, I suppose? So, yeah, you go <laughs> try it and then you look at, okay, I feel like this. Maybe I should go yeah. in this direction, but yeah. Okay. Whereas if you what? have harsh conditions of mud and then an unknown quantity of bike suspension and you put the two together, you don't really know where you are. <laughs> it doesn't end well, does it? What What about track speed? So like uh, where I live, I would say the tracks are not that fast. Some of the downhill races that we've been at, the tracks have been really fast in comparison to what I'm used to riding. Is there any reason why the track speed would impact how you set up suspension? Maybe a little bit, yeah. Um, I think faster tracks, you can probably run things a little bit lighter, um, a little bit softer to get rid of chatter and vibration. Mm -hmm. And you're not relying on... uh, Well, let's see how to explain this. If you take some place like Snowshoe, uh, where a lot of the rocks were relatively low speed, if you run a soft setup, the bike ends up going up and down, mm-hmm. which is really not what you want it to do. You want it to go over the rocks. Yeah. So in that case, you'd want a firm setup because you really want all your energy to just push through. Mm-hmm. Whereas if that was steep, you could run it a little bit softer to get some more grip and a little bit less hand fatigue. Okay. Because gravity's pulling you down the hill. Yeah. So I think in general, a steeper setup would be, you'd have the ability to ride things a little bit softer. Mm -hmm. Whereas when it's really flat, you don't want this incredibly soft, like moto enduro setup where you're just climbing, the suspension's moving for every little rock. Yeah, because you're just losing momentum, I guess. Like the energy is yeah. being absorbed rather than pushed down the track. So it's yeah. easier to ride, but it's slower to ride. Yeah, I mean, it's everybody's done a climb on a long travel enduro bike <laughs> where you run into something and the fork just compresses and then the bike goes backwards instead of forwards. Yeah. Run an XC bike, they just kind of climb up and over everything. Yeah. And that's kind of similar. Okay. What about like natural, more natural terrain? less supported terrain versus bike park, big berms, big G-force kind of stuff. Are we looking, would you be looking to change compression in that instance? Maybe a little bit, at least. Like if you're talking enduro versus downhill, maybe. Mm -hmm. Just because a more natural track is usually harder to read and less consistent. Okay. So you want a little bit of forgiveness in your setup. Yeah. which would be a little bit softer. But that, that all comes from just riding. Right? It's like you you can't really set up a trail bike like you can a downhill bike because they're very multi-use, whereas a downhill bike is designed to do one thing and do that thing almost to the T every time. Yeah. So you can really get finicky with setup. Yeah, interesting. Which I was thinking about this a bit lately, and I was trying to work out whether it was like whether suspension setup was more important when you've got more travel, or less important when you've got more travel. Does that's that make a, sense? Yeah, that's a good question, and I don't really know. I think it's far easier to feel on a bike with more travel. Yeah, just because you have more time. Yeah, you have two hundred mils of travel to think about this thing rather than a hundred. Um, but it's equally important and we're really trying to drill that into our XC riders where they're looking for every bit of speed down to the gram. Then why wouldn't you look at suspension as free speed? Yeah. hundred percent. Are they fairly like, you know, let's just put some air in this thing and go ride it then. I'm not calling them out, but like, is there a lot less focus on setup there? Yeah, there's way less focus on suspension setup than there is on cockpit details. Yeah, yeah, body positioning Uh, and aero and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, we see really soft forks, quite firm shocks, and usually really slow rebound. Yeah. 
which again, I'm not, I mean, I did start in XC, but I'm not a world cup XC racer, but, uh, in, in some ways it makes sense because you're a lot of your time is made on the climbs and having a low front end that kind of climbs over everything is maybe useful. Yeah. But the descents are getting pretty wild as well. For sure. I walked down some of it in uh, Lear Gang and I was like, I would not want to be riding that with my saddle up my ass. Like, it's, it's no. pretty tech. And the year it was raining and muddy, it was just, it was brutal. Yeah. Yeah, fair play. XC's come on a bit, hey? Like, it's, pretty, it's impressive what they good. ride. They're good bike riders. Yeah, yeah. Watching some of that, like, Tom Pitcock and Evie Richards, watching them ride down it on an XC bike is... It's a bit of a schooling, to be fair. Yeah. No, it's cool. It's really good to see. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, so if people are, like, struggling, because it is it is complicated, right? And the, the more you delve into it, almost the more complicated it gets because there is a lot of overlap and interaction and you can, cre- you can solve problems in multiple ways and all of them have different compromises and trade-offs. Like, it's the deeper you dig, the bigger the puzzle gets, which some of us like and some of us don't if people are really like they really want their bike to be set up well but they're struggling and they don't feel like they can get there what would you recommend would you recommend like just go with what the manual says and be done with it or buy an acquisition system go use it some of them maybe are getting a little bit better at their recommendations and guidance all right don't do that or find someone that you trust like how how which way would you recommend people go if they're you know, constantly wishing, thinking their bike could be better than it is, but they don't have to get it there. I, I, if you're constantly wishing that, I really push people to just learn. Uh huh. The the ninety five percent is easily achievable for anyone. It's it's just not that hard. It does take a little bit of time, and maybe a little bit of organization of a notebook and some pressures, but. If you can't set sag, then I'm scared that you're riding a bicycle. <laughs> yeah, it's not that hard, is it's, it? <laughs> it's far harder to pedal a bike than it is to set sag. <laughs> True. Chances are you're just lazy. Yeah, okay. And there's a few of those around, right? And if they're happy with that, yeah, that's fine. Sure. But yeah. If you don't care, have at it. Yeah. What I mean, there are more and more people doing suspension setup now uh, of mixed experience and i would guess as a result mixed quality of outcome like would you recommend people going down that route and if they did like what questions would you ask like how would you go about finding someone to work with that you think would be able to do a good job man that's that's a tricky one eh <laughs> that's really hard because i would say the majority have no clue okay um, I think if you can ask a few questions, you can probably weed out most of them just by kind of asking about their theory. And if their theory is, oh, well, everybody else does this, but we do this, mm-hmm. then you can pretty much count them out right away. <laughs> yeah, okay. There is. There does seem to be like quite a lot of personal bias floating around in suspension setup i would yeah. say i i have never found personal bias to work with science uh-huh. which is a lot of what this is yeah um there's data driven guys that have part of the picture and there's kind of functionally driven people that have part of the picture but you can't really use any one thing if i had to pick i wouldn't pick a guy that set your bike up with data okay interesting you Uh, would be more feel based yeah following a process and a feel based system is going to get you farther than somebody with a data system telling you well your shock is doing this Mm -hmm. so we need to make this change yeah um without even looking at the entire picture, which is what happens to a lot of people using data only. So would you, Uh, for example, if you were to measure, let's pick three podium, let's say three randomly, three podium capable male riders, and you went and measured, 
you, someone else, some independent rider went and rode their three bikes down a hill and measured the suspension, would the numbers all be different? Does that, like, is everyone... A number's part of it, but not all of the story because it depends how you ride, your style, like your positioning. Yeah, numbers are part of it, but they're much bigger part of development than they are of continuing the process and, and race, at least for us. Yeah. Um, you have to have a feel and an understanding of what's happening. And different riders with different positions will be able to run different setups slightly. Mm. Everybody's in a pretty close envelope. Yeah. Um, it's not it's not wildly different, but body types change things. Different limb lengths change things a little bit. Um, again, the rider being such a massive part of the system has an ability to affect everything just by how they feel and sit. Yeah. So a 200 pound rider that's 1.6 meters tall is going to ride completely different than a 200 pound rider that's two meters tall. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say like um, trying to think of maybe not opposite ends of the spectrums, but riders that are quite a long way apart that ride Fox, maybe like Jackson at one end and Amory at the other, like small, lightweight rider, light, poppy style, playful Amory, much bigger. Still, I mean, he's not actually as huge in real life as I thought he was going to be from seeing him on no. on the TV. But like strong, but he is incredibly strong and push yeah. like like aggressively pushes the bike through. Whereas Jackson seems yeah. to skip over. Like, yeah. would even those two guys see fairly similar numbers on suspension if you put data on there, or are they maybe quite... not if you're picking Amory? Jackson's <laughs> setup is very neutral. Okay. I mean, anybody could ride it. Yeah. Uh, Emory's setup is maybe a bit stiffer and quite fast rebound wise. Yeah. Um, so is he mo he's more of an outlier in the data set than Jackson would be then? Yeah, I would say so. I would say like yeah, okay. Loic, Finn, and then definitely Emory and Tebow. They're 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 on a slightly different trajectory. Okay, slightly different approach to how to get a bike set up and ride it fast down. Yeah, some of that's your body and your preference, and some of that is uh, your components and and how they have to be set up to to work. Yeah, so everybody has a slightly different outlook on how things are supposed to function. Fair. Okay. Interesting. We should wrap up soon because we could talk about this stuff forever and potentially yeah. go around in a few different circles. But um, there's, I know the manuals give an indication of service hours. I have no idea how long I've spent on any bikes this year or any year. I just yeah. really don't manage to keep track of that even close. Like, is there something you would say we might feel that would indicate a service would be a good idea? Like, how do you decide? Maybe it's different. You can pop in the workshop and it's ask probably, someone to strip it down. It's definitely but... different for me. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, you can feel it, but not unless you're really paying attention. Uh huh. And things tend to work quite well for quite a while, especially if you're not power washing and, and spraying stuff all over your bike. Yeah. Uh, I think for the average person, if you're not getting it done at least once a year, you're definitely doing your your product a disservice okay how often would you say the average person rides like how many hours a week maybe five hours a week okay yeah so an, a, a more um, than annual service at that usage rate would be yeah needed yeah and it's so hard because people have multiple bikes people sometimes you go for a road ride instead of a mountain bike ride but yeah different weather uh, climates all sorts i guess play into this but yeah Coil shocks tend to go quite a while. There's just very little in there other than the oil for the yeah. damping. They tend to last a long time. Mm -hmm. Air shocks uh, can definitely benefit from service. It's more involved and it takes a bit of time. Doing a lower service on forks, almost any competent bike racer should be able to service their own forks. Yeah, It's just so easy. 
there's there's no excuse. If you're a bike racer, there's no excuse for not being able to do that. Yeah. Um, and I realize our a lot of our air shocks are a little bit complicated to service, so I get it. Uh, some of the other stuff we make is a five minute air can service. Mm-hmm. So again, you need to you need to pay attention to that stuff. It's yeah. expensive, so you might as well take care of it. And if you're focusing on settings and all this other stuff, and it's not serviced then you're kind of wasting your time twice. Yeah, true. The, the way the fork performs that when it gets a bit long in the tooth on servicing definitely yeah. is different, right? Like the speeds that Absolutely. things will move at will drastically slow, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, it's been really interesting. I hope that there's some useful information in there for people. There's definitely some stuff that's given me some more color to the picture and some things to go away and try when the weather comes above zero and we can go out and ride again. Um, but yeah, if people are intrigued by Fox, like where should they be looking to keep up to speed with what Fox is doing? I know you've had a super successful YouTube series with uh, with Dial the last couple of years, hey? Yeah, you can always revisit the Dial series that has a homepage at ridefox.com, which is pretty cool. Yeah. How does it feel? A, you've you've become wild, right. kind of web website famous like as off the back of that series right i think most of us that were like really into the sport knew who you were before but now that the reach is a lot wider i would say yeah it's pretty crazy i think there's definitely a thirst for figuring out how bikes work and what people are doing with them which is cool yeah it is cool i love the episodes where it's like the riders coming into the pit or wherever the bottom of the track and saying oh i'm feeling this and like you're talking about how to move things like I, I i definitely feel like i learn i get some context for that whole picture it helps me maybe translate some of what i've felt in my head and thought about into what i might change on the bike i've i've found it it's been useful in that way it's kind of cool to see that we're all even at that level like it's all the same kind of things right it's not they're not doing it anything is. massively different to us yeah, and maybe listening to other people's problems helps you sort out your own. It's kind of like going through yeah. the issue. Yeah, definitely. But yeah. I, what I and do then, hope at what, the end of the day, sorry, it just I just don't no, want to overcomplicate it because just starting out is easy. Like yeah. we're getting mired in details of the last two or three percent, but the critical thing is just doing those first steps of sag volume rebound. Yeah, just something yeah just do do a bit that's the message right and then where yeah. is it ridefoxbike.com for the website ridefox.com ridefox.com for the website ridefoxbike yeah. is the instagram yeah cool and if they want to follow you and watch what you're up to where well, is dialed the best place or your instagram, on instagram. Yeah. yeah how Cordy many Tortez. how many uh dms do you get a week these days asking for suspension help fair bit <laughs> it's Super frustrating. There's, it's hard because I I like to answer valid questions, uh -huh. but most of them are just so ridiculous and so lazy. Yeah, this would have been a two minute search on Instagram. I mean on 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 Google. Yeah, you know it's. I, I'd love to be available for somebody that has a valid question that put in some effort. So if someone shows that they've, they've done the work, just, yeah, yeah, fair. Awesome, man. Well, it's been interesting chatting. I look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully at some World Cups next year. Um, For sure. But yeah, until then, all the best. You too, man. Good to see you again. Thanks, Geordie.